Despite my lingering suspicions, my love for her remained steadfast. Strange occurrences, unprecedented in our fifteen years of marriage, set off alarm bells in my mind. Her style transformed drastically when the new boss assumed control at her office. Suddenly, our domestic life took a turn for the better. She initiated intimacy, a departure from her past behavior. Nighttime texts became routine, as did late meetings after work. Though she offered plausible explanations for each occurrence, my innate jealousy simmered beneath the surface. I instructed the private investigation firm to withhold any findings until their investigation concluded. I hoped against hope that my concerns were merely the product of an overactive imagination. Three months later, I received a comprehensive dossier that shattered my illusions. Video footage, audio recordings, and photographs confirmed my worst fears. Without hesitation, I instructed Grant, my attorney, to initiate divorce proceedings, demanding the papers be prepared by Wednesday afternoon. Unbeknownst to her, I plotted to confront them during their Thursday night tryst, a surprise in store for the illicit couple. Her audacity astounded me. Polly, of all people, should have known better. She knows me intimately, my intuition, my determination, my unforgiving nature. She witnessed firsthand my ruthlessness in business, how I rose to power and decimated my competitors. Now I command a significant stake in a major trucking company, earning the respect of drivers and teamsters alike through fair treatment. I've lavished Polly with everything, treating her like royalty, a fact she proudly shares with friends and family. Yet, despite her adoration, she jeopardized it all for a fleeting affair. Why? This question haunts me relentlessly, even in these final hours. Why would she throw away everything we built together? Why? It remains my most haunting inquiry. Holly's actions were baffling, given her role as a dedicated mother and wife. Juggling household duties and a full-time job as an executive assistant at a local tech company, she seemed to have it all together. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine she would stray. I'm Henry Cooper, Polly's husband of 15 years, and the father of our two preteen daughters who adore their daddy. I fit the archetype of an alpha male, unyielding in demeanor, but cherishing my wife as the prize she truly is. Though I possess my father's imposing stature, standing at six feet six inches and weighing 265 pounds of muscle, I am a gentle giant until provoked. Polly witnessed my protective instincts in action on a couple of occasions when we were out together, and she attracted unwanted attention. With her long legs, slim waist, and angelic face, she naturally draws admiring glances, fueling my simmering jealousy, a flaw I struggle to rein in. Twice in our fifteen years together, my jealousy erupted into action. When aggressive men disregarded Polly's refusal and attempted to pull her onto the dance floor, they underestimated my resolve. In those moments, I unleashed my strength, dislocating one man's shoulder and inflicting a concussion on another. I refuse to tolerate disrespect, but my wife knows firsthand the lengths I will go to protect her. Given Polly's familiarity with my protective nature, her decision to engage in an affair raises perplexing questions. Why would she risk everything we've built together, knowing the depths of my loyalty and the extent of my devotion to her? It's a puzzle that continues to haunt me. Date night, Thursday. Every detail was meticulously arranged. Accompanied by one of my fixers, I arrived early at the designated location, ensuring a private setting. Generously tipping the hostess ensured they would be seated away from prying eyes. My brilliant wife believed I was out of town, unaware of the trap I was laying. The audio recordings revealed her willingness to rendezvous with her boss on Thursday night. Despite my seething anger, I listened as he eagerly made plans, oblivious to the impending storm. Equipped with software from the PI agency, I monitored Polly's communications, capturing every damning exchange. Each message fueled my fury particularly his audacious request to pick her up from our home. My plan was simple, confront them mid-traced, delivering a performance that would culminate in a stern warning and the shock of divorce papers. Revenge burned within me, 
drowning out any sympathy for the pain I knew my actions would inflict. Despite my conviction, a nagging doubt lingered. Deep down, I knew Polly loved me and her children. Yet the desire for retribution eclipsed any semblance of compassion. Some may argue for forgiveness, citing our years together and the triviality of a mere affair. But as an immature, jealous alpha male, I refused to let another man defy my wife and maintain his grip on her affections. Though my love for her remained, the betrayal irreparably tainted our connection. With eyes and backup strategically positioned, I awaited the signal indicating the opportune moment. Thursday night arrived, and upon receiving confirmation that the couple had been seated and served, I prepared to confront them. Exiting my car, I entered the restaurant, exchanging pleasantries with the hostess, before mustering the composure to execute my plan. As I surveyed the scene, my heart constricted at the sight of the couple, a pang of betrayal mingled with resentment as I beheld my wife, resplendent in a cocktail dress that accentuated her flawless figure, a sight she never bestowed upon me. The inexplicable act fueled my simmering fury, intensifying my determination to unravel the truth. Stealing myself, I approached from the side, their obliviousness fueling my resolve. Polly and her companion remained engrossed in each other, their intimacy a stark contrast to the impending confrontation. With calculated precision, I positioned myself at their table, unnoticed until I pulled a chair from a nearby table, eliciting a reaction that ranged from shock to guilt upon Polly's face. Addressing her with forced joviality, I feigned ignorance of the situation. Polly's attempt to maintain composure, coupled with her introduction of me to her unsuspecting date, only fueled my disdain. The facade of normalcy shattered as the confrontation commenced. She was a master of deception. I had to give her that. Smooth and quick on her feet, she effortlessly veiled her deceit. As my ordered drink arrived, I brushed off Polly's fabrications and raised my glass in a calculated toast. Let's raise our glasses, I declared with a congenial smile, diverting attention from her attempted subterfuge. Here's to an intriguing evening and a new chapter. Turning to her boss, Jasper, I engaged him in conversation, feigning ignorance of Polly's transgressions. Jasper, do you know the secret to Polly in my fifteen years of blissful marriage? It's built on a foundation of honesty and trust. Are you married, Jasper? I queried, already armed with knowledge gleaned from the report. Yes, happily married for twenty years with four wonderful children, Jasper replied, echoing my sentiments on the importance of trust and honesty in marriage. Marvelous to hear, Jasper, I remarked, turning the spotlight back to Polly. And Polly, would you say you share the same sentiments? Yes, darling. Trust and honesty are paramount in our relationship, Polly affirmed confidently, her demeanor betraying no hint of guilt or apprehension. You see, Jasper, our marriage thrives on mutual trust. I continued, watching their discomfort with a calculated sip from my glass. As long as Polly remains faithful, she knows she has my unwavering love and support. With each carefully chosen word, I tightened the noose of my game, intent on unraveling their facade. So, how long have you two been dating? I inquired nonchalantly, a grin plastered across my face. Polly's irritation flared as she attempted to regain control, her tone indignant. Honey, this is strictly a business meeting. She retorted, casting me a reproachful glance. Please refrain from embarrassing me in front of my boss with your baseless jealousy. You know me better than that. Seizing the opportunity, her date chimed in, eager to assert his innocence. Indeed, Henry, this is purely business, he interjected, adopting a conciliatory tone. I needed to discuss some upcoming changes with Polly. I apologize if there's been any misunderstanding, but rest assured, my intentions are purely professional. Feigning contrition, I offered a sheepish apology. I'm sorry for any misunderstanding, I muttered, adopting a chastened demeanor. So this is just a business dinner, then? No romantic entanglements. That's correct, Henry, Polly affirmed with forced conviction. Just business meetings, 
nothing more. Please stop this childish behavior. Bowing my head in false submission, I continued to play my part. I'm sorry, I murmured, struggling to contain my simmering resentment. Seeing you in that alluring dress, accompanied by this charming man, well, you can understand why I might feel a tad insecure. Jasper's reassurance only served to fuel my resolve. Henry, there's no need to apologize, he offered, patting me on the back. If my wife were in your shoes, I'd likely feel the same. As tension dissipated, I signaled to the man observing from the bar. With a thick folder in hand, he approached the table, delivering the damning evidence. As I laid out the incriminating photos, I turned to Polly, my voice heavy with sorrow. Polly, I love you with all my heart. I whispered, my words laced with pain, but you shattered our marriage with your betrayal. I'll never forget the things I saw and heard. Thank you for destroying everything we had. Polly's gasp echoed through the tense silence as her hands flew to cover her mouth. Jasper, visibly in rage, demanded to know the source of the incriminating photos, but I silenced him with a curt command. As I laid out the damning evidence, I took a moment to scrutinize each photo, punctuating the air with pointed remarks. Polly's tears flowed freely now, her pleas for mercy falling on deaf ears as I endeavored to keep our confrontation discreet, mindful of the prying eyes of neighboring tables. Realizing the gravity of her predicament, Polly grasped for a lifeline. I'm sorry, baby, she implored, desperation tainting her voice. Let's leave and talk about this. It's not what it seems, I promise. I regarded her with a sardonic smirk, deliberately drawing out my response. Not what it seems, I echoed slowly, my tone laced with disbelief. Are you truly prepared to continue this charade? Know this, both of you. I possess hours of incontrovertible evidence, videos, audio recordings, texts, emails, and more. And Polly, after witnessing those videos, I never imagined you capable of such deceit. You hid that side of yourself well, but rest assured, I understand everything now. Gesturing to my associate, I directed him to explain our purpose. With a solemn nod, I presented Polly with the divorce papers, my voice heavy with finality. Polly, our marriage is over. I declared, my words a cold indictment. You and your lover have irreparably damaged my love for you. Tonight you'll sign these papers, witnessed by our notary friend at the bar. Refuse, and I'll expose every sordid detail to your parents, friends, and worst of all, our children. I've been fair in this divorce, but our daughters will live with me. They deserve better than a cheater for a mother. Jasper, my friend, I began, my voice cool and determined. I suggest you persuade your girlfriend here to sign these papers before I leave. Otherwise, I'll be delivering copies of all the evidence to your wife and your executive team at work. Once I'm done, you'll be out of a job, and Regina will ensure you're ruined financially for a very long time. I'd rather not go down that road, so convince her to sign the divorce papers, and then my soon-to-be ex-wife is all yours. I want nothing to do with that cheating moment ever again. The weight of my words hung heavy in the air. Slicing through Polly's defenses, the prospect of losing custody of her daughters added another layer of desperation to her tear-streaked face, while her boyfriend's panic was palpable. Polly's pleas for forgiveness echoed with familiar desperation, empty promises to make amends, explanations, and declarations of love. But I remained unmoved, steeling myself against her emotional onslaught. Dismissing her entreaties, I rose from my seat with finality. I'll be heading to the men's room, I announced firmly. When I return, those papers had better be signed. If not, prepare yourselves for a level of hell you can't even imagine. Left alone with her lover, Polly's sobs intensified, her desperation mounting as she grasped for a lifeline. Jasper, sensing the gravity of the situation, acted swiftly. Polly, just sign them, he urged urgently, but ask him to hold on to them for a week. Use that time to convince him you love him, that you'll do anything to salvage your marriage. Promise therapy, whatever it takes, but make him wait a week. It's the only chance we have. 
I don't want a divorce, Polly cried, her voice choked with emotion. Trust me, if you can get him to wait, I'm sure you can save your marriage. Think about the children. You don't want to lose the girls, do you? I implored, knowing the gravity of the situation. Her tears flowed anew, and after a few agonizing minutes I returned to the table. Well, have you signed them yet? I asked, my tone clipped. With a heavy heart, she met my gaze and spoke in a voice laden with sorrow. Honey, I'll do whatever you want, including signing these papers. But please can you give me just one week? One week to be with my girls and talk. After fifteen years, please give me that much. I sat in silence, contemplating her plea. Even though you deserve nothing from me after what you've done, I'll give you that. I conceded begrudgingly. You can come home, but you'll stay in one of the guest bedrooms. I don't want you near my bed during this time. Now sign them so I can leave. As she signed the papers, I gathered them into the folder and stood to depart. Before leaving, I took her hand in mine, watching as she smiled until I removed her wedding rings, dropping mine into her wine glass. Her crestfallen expression brought a small measure of satisfaction, a fleeting acknowledgement of the pain she'd inflicted. Turning to Jasper, I delivered a final warning. Well, asshole, she's your date now. Do what you want with her, I spat, seething with contempt. But remember you slept with my wife, destroyed our marriage, and endangered a lot, including my children's love for their mother. Your ass is mine, and I have your balls in my hand. Don't cross me. You're lucky I didn't carry out my original plans for you. It's far from over between us, you scumbag. You'll be hearing from me soon. Got it. Jasper nodded silently as I loomed over him, a silent testament to the disruption of their evening plans. As I made to depart, Polly seized my arm, her voice pleading. Henry, can I please come home with you? I just want to be with you. Please. I recoiled from her touch as if scorched by fire, my disgust palpable. I have no desire to be seen with a traitor like you, I retorted, my disdain evident. You disgust me. I'm ashamed to have been your husband. Admittedly, I was far from gracious in that moment, but frankly, I didn't care. Despite the tumult of emotions within me, I took pride in my ability to contain my jealousy and anger. I had given her a week to ponder her actions. Now it was time to see what would unfold. The following morning, I heard her return home late in the evening, quietly retreating to the guest suite, a tacit acknowledgement of the strained atmosphere between us. The next morning, as we crossed paths in the kitchen, I remained resolute in my determination for retribution. Good morning, cheater. I greeted her coldly, my tone dripping with contempt. How is my cheating wife today? She flinched, her gaze dropping to her coffee cup, as she uttered the familiar refrain of every cheating spouse caught in the act. Honey, we need to talk. Listen, there's nothing to discuss, Polly, I interjected, cutting off her attempt at reconciliation. I know everything. I know the extent of your betrayal, the duration of your affair, the disparaging remarks you made about me and our marriage. I witnessed the things you did with him, the way you dressed for him. I heard all the comparisons, all the lies, all the deceit. You took me for a fool, and I can't fathom how foolish you were to believe you could get away with it. Unless there's something I've overlooked, there's nothing left to say. I'm the fool, not you, Polly confessed, tears streaming down her cheeks. I don't know why I let it happen. You gave me everything I ever wanted and I love you regardless of what you heard in those videos. You have to know I never meant to hurt you, and I never wanted you to find out. Exactly my point, Holly, I responded, my voice heavy with disappointment. You never wanted me to find out. You wanted to keep it a secret, to continue lying and sleeping with your lover behind my back. That's the crux of the matter, Polly. I can forgive infidelity. After all, we're all human and make mistakes. But this wasn't a mistake. You chose this, and you chose to keep it a secret, to lie, cheat, and conceal your affair. I love you, Polly, but as Tina Turner says, 
What's love got to do with it? My trust is shattered, and I'm left wondering if I ever truly knew you. How many other men have there been? How many times have you returned to my bed after being with your lover? I'm so disgusted I can barely find the words. Sobbing now, Polly realized the depth of my pain and the gravity of her actions. There were no more excuses or justifications, only an admission of guilt. Okay, I'm guilty, and I hate myself for it, she admitted, her voice choked with remorse. There was never anyone else, and no matter what I say, I know you won't be able to forgive me for what I've done, but I don't want a divorce. I'll do whatever it takes to stay with you. I think I need counseling, and maybe we can go together to figure out what's wrong with me. Please don't leave me. I paused for a moment, considering her plea. Polly, you can go to counseling. Do whatever you need to do, and I'll support you, I replied finally. But I can't live with a woman who could discard me so callously. Your actions and the words you said revealed your true feelings, and I can't see a way forward with someone who feels that way about me. I know there are other women out there who would cherish the chance to be with me. You had your opportunity, and you chose to throw it away. Enjoy your week here with the girls. Try to explain why you're leaving. I won't speak ill of you, but it's important that you tell them you're leaving and why. I stated firmly. In the divorce agreement, I granted you full access to our daughters at all times, but they will be living with me. However, if you continue to engage in promiscuous behavior and set a negative example for our daughters, I will have to reconsider the terms of your visitations. I'll treat you better than you deserve and help you maintain your relationship with our daughters, but I have two questions for you to consider before you answer. Firstly, why? Why did you risk everything for this? And secondly, was it worth it? The following Monday, I contacted Jasper and arranged to meet him for lunch on Wednesday. After convincing him of the importance of our meeting, I expressed my profound disappointment in how he had contributed to the destruction of my marriage and hinted at the potential consequences. Over lunch, I outlined the repercussions of his actions and detailed my expectations for restitution. You're going to pay for Polly's rent and car payments for the next three years. I declared firmly. Consider it your punishment. You're getting off easy, Jasper. Despite everything, I still care for my cheating wife and want her to be taken care of. Since you played a role in this, you'll comply with my demands. This arrangement will help Polly get back on her feet after I kick her out. If you fail to follow through, I'll ensure you lose your job and that Regina learns about your infidelity. Consider it a lifeline, Jasper. This is the consequence of seducing a married woman. People like you need to understand that actions have repercussions. Why not pursue single women instead of tearing apart families? That was a cowardly move, Jasper. Epilogue Despite my anger and hurt, I made sure to treat Polly with decency, allowing her to visit the children and maintaining a cordial relationship. However, she never managed to regain my respect or trust. Jasper faithfully made his payments every month, knowing the consequences if he failed to comply. Polly struggled to provide satisfactory answers to my questions, while she expressed remorse for her actions and admitted they weren't worth it. She couldn't explain the underlying motivation. Now living alone, without a boyfriend and the love she once had, she faced the consequences of her choices. I could have inflicted more pain upon her, but the loss of her family and my love was punishment enough. Despite undergoing counseling, Polly couldn't offer a satisfactory explanation for her actions. Her best attempt was, I don't know why, it just happened. It had nothing to do with you or our marriage, because I do love you and was happy with our life together, but it was something new and exciting. I screwed up. Unable to contain my frustration, I confronted her. If you were truly happy, why did you dress up and wear provocative clothing for him? Why engage in behaviors with him that you never did with me? It just happened isn't a sufficient answer. You repeatedly chose to pursue this affair and dress to entice him each time. Yet you claim to love me. Perhaps one day you'll have the courage to provide a genuine explanation. I believe you owe us that much. For those of us who have been cheated on, this remains an unsolvable riddle.
Thanks to the actions of these two cheating couples, I'm uncertain if I can ever fully trust or commit myself to another woman again. It's a sad reality, but one that I must come to terms with. Story 2 Polly sat alone at the kitchen table, her gaze fixed on the empty coffee cup before her. She dreaded the impending conversation with her husband, Fred, scheduled for today. Thankfully, their children were off at the neighbors for a sleepover, sparing them from the inevitable shouting match that lay ahead. Reflecting on how a bit of harmless flirting and casual lunches had spiraled out of control, Polly couldn't shake the feeling of guilt that weighed heavily on her shoulders. For over a month, she had sensed something amiss, but it wasn't until the latest test results that she knew she had to come clean to Fred. As she waited for him to return from his early morning errand to the store, apprehension gnawed at her. The sudden ring of the doorbell and the rumble of a large truck pulling into the driveway startled Polly. Unprepared for any visitors, she assumed it was just someone lost and seeking directions. May I assist you? Polly greeted, opening the door to the unexpected visitor. Are you Polly Brown? The man queried. Yes, I am Polly Brown. How may I assist you? She repeated, puzzled. I have a work order to pack up your belongings and transport them to 815 Southwest 10th Avenue. The man informed her, thrusting a clipboard toward Polly as he signaled for his crew to begin unloading boxes from the truck. There must be some mistake, Polly protested, handing back the paperwork. I never initiated such an order. Miss, I understand. But the order was placed by Mr. Fred Brown a week ago, he explained, pointing to Fred's signature at the bottom of the document. My husband will be back shortly, and I'm certain he can resolve this misunderstanding, Polly insisted. Mrs. Brown, I just departed from your husband twenty minutes ago, and he instructed me to give you this envelope if you caused any trouble, he stated, handing Polly a large Manila envelope. Now, if you wouldn't mind, could you please direct us to the master bedroom? We've only got an hour to wrap this up, he requested. Polly opened the envelope and glanced briefly at the single sheet of paper. In a barely audible voice, she instructed the workman, first room at the top of the stairs, on the right. The men hurried upstairs, and for the next forty minutes, they worked diligently, packing and hauling box after box to the truck parked in the driveway. Occasionally, they attempted to ask Polly questions, but she seemed mentally elsewhere, so they proceeded as best they could. Within fifty minutes, they announced their completion and readiness to depart. I'll need your signature, Mrs. Brown, the lead workman requested. Polly hastily scrawled something at the bottom of the paper, and they swiftly exited. Exactly ten minutes later, Polly's father arrived. Darling, Harry said, observing his daughter's stunned expression. Fred asked me to pick you up, figuring you might not be in a state to drive, he explained. Your mother's waiting for us, and the movers are ready to drop off your belongings. We'll store everything in the garage for now and sort it out later, Harry informed Polly as he guided her out of the house. This can't be happening, Polly muttered aloud as Harry assisted her into the car. Where's Fred? If Fred were here, he could sort out this entire mess, she pondered silently. He'd listen, wouldn't he? Half an hour later, Fred returned to the house accompanied by a locksmith. Change all the locks, including the code on the garage door opener, he directed the locksmith. Leave me five sets of keys and ensure there's a deadbolt on the side garage door, he instructed, stepping into the now vacant home. Ascending the stairs, Fred found that the workers had done a commendable job, given the tight schedule he had imposed. Glancing at his watch, he realized he had only fifteen minutes before the next truck arrived. Grabbing a couple of empty cartons, he completed the packing of the remaining items the movers had overlooked, including Polly's makeup and toiletries from their bathroom vanity. Carrying down the last two boxes, he noticed the arrival of the next truck. Fred greeted his sister Melissa as she entered with the movers. Hey there, he said, pulling her into a hug. Why don't you take the second bedroom on the left, next to the bathroom? It's much bigger than the spare room, and has a walk-in closet, he suggested. We can sort out the kids' things later. Sure thing, 
What about Polly's car? Melissa inquired. Her dad is supposed to pick it up later tonight, after he's finished with the movers. Fred informed her. Could you handle things here for a bit? I need to swing by the office for a minute. I'll grab pizzas for tonight, he added, heading towards the garage. No mushrooms, Melissa called after him, then turned to direct the movers on where to place everything. Right on time, Fred noted, glancing at his watch. From his car, Fred observed his three best friends engaged in a heated discussion with Simon, a co-worker of his wife, who didn't appear pleased. After about five minutes, Mike, one of the three men, approached Fred's parked car. He thought we were joking until I pulled out my knife, Mike recounted with a grin. Gave him two choices, leave within 24 hours or have an unfortunate accident with said knife. He finished, amusement evident in his tone. How you holding up, buddy? I'll be better tomorrow. Fred replied somberly. Never imagined dealing with anything like this, but I'll manage. He thanked Mike, mentioning he needed to head off but would catch up with him later at the house. Picking up the copies of pictures and receipts dropped off by the investigator at his office on Friday afternoon, Fred knew their contents without needing to open them. They were for his lawyer's reference. Well, there goes a grand. He lamented as he glanced at the invoice. After dropping the envelope at his lawyer's office, Fred grabbed four pizzas, a case of beer, and made his way home. Tonight called for total indulgence, as tomorrow he'd be a single parent, needing to set a new example, certainly not like the one his soon-to-be ex-wife had set. Upon his return, the moving truck had vanished and Melissa, along with a few friends, was busy setting up her bedroom. Hey bro, she greeted Fred as he ascended the stairs. Where's all the muscle you promised me? She quipped. They're wrapping up something for me, but they should be here in about an hour. Why don't we take a break and grab a bite to eat? Fred suggested to Melissa and her friends. Mike and his companions finally arrived just before four o'clock, and by seven o'clock, everyone was gathered, enjoying a few drinks and casual conversation. Everyone, that is, except Fred. Melissa eventually found him in the den, engrossed in old home movies. We got everything upstairs in my room, and everyone's finished eating. Is there anything I can get for you? She asked. Not right now, honey, but thanks for asking. Fred responded. I just need some time alone. That's all. Well, I'll be in the kitchen if you need anything. Melissa assured him, planting a kiss on the top of his head before closing the door. I never saw it coming. Fred murmured to himself. How could I have been so blind? Just over a month ago, while paying bills online, Fred stumbled upon a charge for a checkup at the local clinic. Han, did you go to the doctor a week ago? He called out to his wife, who was in the kitchen preparing dinner. I thought I had the flu and went in for a B12 shot, she yelled back. Ridiculous rates, he muttered to himself as he examined the bill. $125 for a simple exam and a B-12 shot, even after insurance. I'll call them tomorrow. Maybe there's a mistake, he thought, though deep down he knew there wasn't. The following day, Fred dialed the clinic's billing department from his office. Good morning. How can I assist you? The receptionist answered. My wife, Polly Brown, visited your clinic two weeks ago, and I believe we were overcharged for her visit, he explained. She only had a routine exam and a B-12 shot, but we were billed $125 when it should have been no more than $45 after insurance, Fred replied curtly, ending the call. Can you say heart attack? Why on earth was Polly getting a pregnancy test, especially considering Fred had undergone a vasectomy right after their second child? It didn't require a genius to piece together what might be going on. Ten minutes later, Fred found himself seated at his desk, leafing through the yellow pages in search of a private investigator. Until then, he had never doubted Polly's fidelity. But now, uncertainty gnawed at him. Fred had never anticipated the cost of having his wife surveilled. She must be involved with someone from work, he confided in the P.I. 
She consistently returns home at the same time, and aside from occasional team-building seminars, she's always at the office. I need you to commence immediately, because I'm going insane, not knowing if she's been unfaithful, and I damn well need to know with whom. His next call was to Ben, a close friend who also worked in Polly's division. Ben, Fred Brown here, he began. I hate to ask, but I need to speak with you outside of work, if possible. Can we meet at Moe's after hours? Great, see you around 5.30, he arranged. Fred wasn't entirely certain how to broach the subject with Ben, but figured honesty, given their long-standing friendship, would be the most effective approach. As they sat sipping on Bud Lights, Fred broached the difficult topic. Ben, I've just discovered that Polly is cheating on me, and I suspect it's someone from her workplace, he confided. It seems to have been going on for a couple of months, and I need to identify the person. Ben was taken aback. No way, Fred. Polly would never do that to you. There must be some misunderstanding. No misunderstanding, Ben. I have evidence. I just need to know who it is, Fred insisted. Fred, our company isn't that big, and I know most of the employees by their first names. Ben reassured him. Sure, there's the usual office banter, but nothing more than that. However, I have two colleagues owing me big favors, and they'll know if anything's up. Trust me, I'll reach out if I uncover anything. I'm sorry about Polly, he added sincerely. No more than I am. Fred responded quietly. The next three days were agonizing. Fred wrestled with the urge to confront Polly and demand answers, but at this juncture, it seemed futile. Their sex life, while not extraordinary, was satisfactory. They made love about twice a week, which seemed reasonable given their parental responsibilities. Yet Polly hadn't expressed any desire to explore new things in bed and she continued to reject Fred's requests for certain intimate acts. Nothing had changed in that regard. One detail stuck in Fred's mind. Whenever Polly returned from her monthly seminars, they never engaged in intimacy that night. Perhaps it was mere coincidence, but Fred couldn't help but scrutinize every detail for anomalies. These seminars typically took place on Friday afternoons at the Best Western and lasted for around two hours, followed by a casual gathering for happy hour and snacks. On those evenings, Fred would take his kids out or visit his parents for dinner, ensuring they didn't return home until after eight o'clock. He found himself questioning every aspect of his marriage, desperately searching for a motive behind Polly's infidelity. On Friday morning, Ben called with an update. If she's involved with someone at work, it's likely a new guy named Simon Turner. He joined last year, and there's talk that they've had lunch together a few times and have been spotted dancing during happy hour, he informed Fred. I know it's not concrete evidence, but it's the best leave I could find. I hope you two can work things out. Thanks for the intel, but I'm not holding out much hope, Fred replied somberly. He passed the information along to the private investigator Ben had recommended and then closed up shop, heading home. How was he supposed to play the role of the normal loving husband when all he wanted to do was kick Polly out and try to piece together his shattered life? The weekend proceeded with typical family activities. Yard work, soccer practice, and a neighborhood barbecue on Sunday. Despite Polly's attempts to initiate intimacy on Saturday night, Fred made an excuse about an upset stomach and turned away, feigning sleep. Thankfully, Monday arrived offering Fred respite from the turmoil at home. Work became his refuge, a place where he could focus and set his plans into motion. The final piece of the puzzle was initiating the divorce proceedings. He had already retained a lawyer and paid the retainer. Living in a no-fault state and both being employed, Fred sought an equitable 50-50 split with no spousal support. However, one non-negotiable demand was full custody of their two daughters. Polly's betrayal was monumental, and unless she agreed to his terms, he threatened to expose her infidelity to everyone she knew. Anticipating Polly's reaction, Fred obtained a restraining order, 
ensuring she couldn't come within 250 feet of the house, though she could still call the girls. By Tuesday, the private investigator had uncovered damning evidence. Two motel room receipts from Best Western, registered under Simon's name, on the Friday seminar nights. Surveillance photos depicted Polly and Simon arm in arm entering the room, with one capturing them kissing in the hallway. Fred declined to view the incriminating images, instructing the investigator to compile everything into a Manila envelope and deliver it to his office. He expressed gratitude for the swift work and assured payment would be sent promptly. By the end of the eventful week, all arrangements had been made. The kids were scheduled for sleepovers on Friday and Saturday nights. Both sets of movers were booked. The locksmith was set to arrive by two o'clock and the paperwork would be filed on Monday, served on Tuesday afternoon. Polly has no idea what's about to hit her, Fred mused, determined to maintain the element of surprise. Polly's story. Seated at the kitchen table, engulfed in self-pity, I was caught off guard when the movers arrived at the door. I instructed them to wait until Fred returned, but when he handed me the envelope, my heart sank. With a sinking feeling, I realized that Fred was aware of everything. It contained a copy of the pregnancy test I had taken at the clinic. Initially, I dismissed my symptoms as the flu, a common ailment circulating at the time. However, as days passed and the illness lingered without the usual body aches, an unsettling thought crept into my mind. It was Carol's light-hearted remark one morning. Sounds like you're pregnant again, Polly, that planted the seed of possibility in my mind. Simon's arrival coincided with my thirtieth birthday, a milestone that left me feeling like an aging married woman. I assisted in his training, finding him to be pleasant, impeccably scented, and quite handsome. Despite our five-year age gap, we shared similar tastes in music and a mutual love for Mexican cuisine. Our interactions escalated as we began meeting for lunches at the local Mexican restaurant and rendezvousing vowsing for drinks after our monthly seminars. One Friday evening during a team-building event, the music beckoned us to the dance floor. We swayed through two fast-paced songs before a slow melody began. I hadn't danced a slow dance with anyone since my marriage. It was Simon. It felt effortless. As we glided across the floor, a wave of warmth enveloped me and I found solace in his embrace. Reluctantly, we returned to the group after the song ended, but the memory lingered. The evening grew warmer as we indulged in a couple more drinks, and soon I found myself on the road heading home. The memory of the dance and the undeniable chemistry lingering in my thoughts. I knew I should have ended it, but the time spent with Simon was too enjoyable to resist. Dancing and a few lunches seemed innocent enough, or so I convinced myself. It wasn't until the fourth Friday gathering that things took a turn. Our department received an award for being top producers, each of us rewarded with a $100 bonus. We decided to celebrate at the bar, and after a couple of hours, only four of us remained. I had indulged a bit too much and realized I needed coffee before attempting to drive home. Simon offered to accompany me. En route to the restaurant, I stumbled on a carpet, and Simon swiftly caught me before I hit the ground. Holding me by the waist and chest as he helped me upright, he asked, Are you all right? In a moment of impulse, I locked eyes with him and kissed him. It caught him off guard, but he responded almost instantly. After what felt like an eternity, I pulled back, my cheeks flushed with embarrassment. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I stammered, feeling mortified. Please forgive me. Don't worry about it, Polly, Simon reassured me with a chuckle. Consider it your thanks for saving your life. Now let's get some coffee into you, he suggested, leading me into the restaurant. The following week, I kept my distance from Simon as much as possible. I made sure to be busy during lunchtime and avoided stopping by for happy hour the next Friday. It had been a terrible mistake, yet I couldn't shake the feeling of arousal every time I thought about being in Simon's arms. However, despite her resolution, two weeks later, Polly found herself back at happy hour. 
with Fred not expected back until around 8.30, she arranged to have dinner and drinks with a few of her colleagues. Curiously, everyone seemed to have excuses for leaving early, until it was just Polly and Simon remaining by 6.30. Shall we grab something to eat? Simon suggested to Polly. As the music began to play, Polly seized the opportunity and invited Simon to dance. To her surprise, the evening unfolded with four slow songs played consecutively, and they danced everyone. With each step, Polly felt her heart pounding against her chest, finding solace in Simon's embrace. Before she knew it, they found themselves in the backseat of Simon's car, where they indulged in everything but intercourse. Time slipped away and it was almost eight o'clock when they finally realized. Straightening her dress and hair, Polly exchanged one final kiss with Simon before heading to her car. Despite the gravity of her actions, Polly found herself devoid of shame. It wasn't until she reunited with her husband and children that the weight of her guilt began to settle in. That night, Fred desired her, but Polly couldn't bear to meet his gaze, let alone engage in intimacy. After a lengthy shower, she slipped into bed, seeking solace in Fred's embrace for the remainder of the night. Aware of the danger she was playing with, Polly couldn't resist the allure of her forbidden liaison. They began sneaking around during lunch breaks, the thrill of secrecy adding to the intensity of their encounters. A week later, Simon revealed that he had booked a room for Friday night at the Best Western, in anticipation of their rendezvous. We parted ways at the bar, agreeing to reconvene in the hotel corridor. Are you sure about this? Simon questioned, his voice tinged with uncertainty. I'm not entirely certain, but let's not linger in the hallway, Polly replied, urgency creeping into her tone. Within moments of entering the room, their restraint dissolved, and they found themselves tearing off each other's clothes in a frenzy of desire. Polly returned home 45 minutes before Fred and the kids were due back. They met twice more before Polly fell ill, attributing it to what she thought was the flu. When Carol suggested she might be pregnant, panic set in, and Polly rushed to the doctor. She couldn't fathom the results indicating pregnancy. After all, Simon always used protection, and Fred had undergone a vasectomy. As she stared at the test results, Polly realized she was in a dire situation, trapped in more ways than one. Sitting alone in the kitchen, she awaited Fred's return, knowing she had to break the news to him. Little did she know, her world was about to shatter into pieces. Fred sought retribution from both Polly and Simon. He demanded Simon leave town, never to return, so he wouldn't have to endure the sight of him again. As for Polly, Fred harbored a deep desire to see her suffer for tearing apart their once happy family. With his unmarried sister, Melissa, moving in to assist him in raising their two daughters, Fred faced the daunting task of navigating the complexities of female adolescence without a clue of where to begin. Despite the challenges ahead, Fred drew strength from the unwavering support of his parents, knowing that they would weather the storm together. On Sunday, Fred gathered his daughters and Melissa, gently explaining the turmoil between him and their mother. He reassured them that they could still see their mother whenever they wished, though she wouldn't be living with them anymore. Tears were shed, but a comforting bowl of ice cream helped soothe their emotions. By Tuesday, Polly had been served with divorce papers. Despite her persistent attempts to reach out, Fred remained resolute in his silence. Even Melissa's efforts to convey the finality of the situation fell on deaf ears. Fred took decisive action, canceling all shared financial arrangements and removing Polly from his insurance, 401, and other accounts. However, Fred allowed Polly to see the children on Wednesday. Melissa accompanied them to Polly's parents' house, providing a supportive presence during their visit. The next time Fred encountered Polly was during their meeting with the lawyers in the attorney's office, where the dissolution of their marriage would be legally formalized. Polly's lawyer launched into a series of demands, prompting Fred to rise and prepare to exit. We've just begun. Where are you going? The lawyer inquired. I'll say this once. Fred replied in a low voice. The terms stand as they are. Polly will have visitation rights, but physical custody will be mine. 
I refuse to subject my children to the birth of her illegitimate child conceived with another man. Challenge me on this or anything else, and I won't hesitate to expose the truth about my soon-to-be ex-wife, so I suggest you carefully consider your next move before speaking again. Following a brief recess to calm tensions, the proceedings resumed. Polly, tearfully, conceded to Fred's terms, and they all proceeded to sign the documents. I'm truly sorry. Fred, I don't know how I allowed this to happen. I did love you, Polly sobbed. I suppose not enough, Fred replied coolly. As he exited, Fred glanced back at Polly. Since you conceived a child at a team-building seminar, perhaps you can claim it as a work-related injury and seek compensation, he remarked with a wry chuckle before walking away for the final time. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.